Carlos Nelson with Cascade Sports. And today we have uh, Mr. Bob Kendricks uh, on. I would like to thank one of my personal friends uh, doing an excellent job at the uh, Negro Baseball League uh, Museum. Uh, good afternoon, Bob. Hey, Carlos, what's going on, man? How you doing? It's all good. Hey, Bob, uh, let's talk about what the Negro League is doing right now. And off camera, I talked to you how excited I am that Buck is coming up uh, for that Hall of Fame deal. Why don't you run it down to our uh, sports fans on what's going on over there at that Negro League? Man, I tell you what, the place has been jumping. We've got a lot of great things happening right now. You just mentioned the uh, great news that we got last week that Buck O'Neill is on the ballot for Hall of Fame consideration 15 years, man, after he didn't get in. And, and it's still hard to believe that it's been 15 years since we lost the legendary Buck O'Neill that early in the year 2006, he was up along with a, a group of other Negro Leaguers and he missed by one vote getting in. And, and quite frankly, Carlos, I had basically figured it was a wrap on the Negro Leagues, not just Buck, but on the Negro Leagues in general, because that election in 2006 was supposed to be the end all for the Negro Leagues. That committee had been tasked with putting in all of the players from the Negro Leagues who they believe were worthy of Hall of Fame consideration. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, Buck missed by one vote. And so I had kind of written this thing off. And then 15 years later, his name is now back on the ballot and he's being reconsidered for baseball's highest honor. We absolutely believe that Buck O'Neill deserves to be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And for me, I have to look at it from two perspectives. I have to plan as if it's going to happen, because if it does, it will set off a major Buck O'Neill to Cooperstown celebration and how exciting that would be for his museum, an opportunity to raise resources to support his museum. Then I also have to think about what happens if he doesn't get in. Because now I got to answer all these questions. People are going to ask me why. And I can't answer the question why, because I won't know. And it'll bring back those painful memories of 2006. It was mentally and emotionally distressful for me over that period of time. And then that is coupled with the fact that we lost. I lost my friend. He died later that year. And, and so that was as challenging a set of circumstances as I've ever had to deal with. And the emotional roller coaster, man, was tremendous because we all thought it was a shoe in. We thought for sure that Buck O'Neill is going in the Hall of Fame. I actually felt like the Hall of Fame put the process together with Buck O'Neill in mind. And then it didn't happen. And Can I cut you off for a minute, Bob? Let yeah. me say this. I, you know, we talked off camera a little bit. I feel that you was like Buck's son to a degree. And you, you had all the hidden treasures as it relates to storytelling, uh, because I've worked with you enough and those specials that we did with you, uh, I show them often and I say, Bob sat there and he must have wrapped off 20 uh, of those uh, uh, instrument facts. And I know you got a lot of that from Buck. Oh, now, course. what I'm going to say is on a spiritual side, <laughs> I think that Buck not getting in was the universe. And that puts you in high gear, really high gear, because you said <laughs> what you just said that it was hard and off camera, I told you, you've been going <laughs> Negro Lee and that's the spirit of Buck. Yeah. In my, in my mind, because I've worked yeah, I, with you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree that, you know, and I tell people all the time, man, that's not a day that goes by I don't talk to Buck. I talk to Buck every day. Now, he don't always talk back to me, but I talk to him every single day because I try to draw from the wisdom that he shared. You know, just being around him, I, I tell people all the time, the smartest thing I ever did was I kept my mouth closed and I listened because there was so much wisdom to draw from. He didn't force it on you, 
But he threw out these nuggets to give you something to ponder, something to think about. And so now when I have difficult decisions to make, uh, I just feel like he's looking over my shoulder. He's guiding my steps. And, and so, yeah, no, to be a protege of Buck O'Neill is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And so even though I had written it off about the possibility of him getting in the Hall of Fame, here we are now 15 years later, and that is being reexamined. And, and I'll be honest, Carlos, it won't mean quite the same to me because he's gone. We didn't get that opportunity to celebrate with our guy. You are an athlete, man. You know that the Hall of Fame in whatever sports discipline you are involved, that's the pinnacle for any athlete. The Mecca, man. And, 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 yeah, no, and we wanted that for Buck, but we wanted to celebrate with Buck. You know what I mean? But tell I, me I, this. Uh-uh, tell me this. What do you think Buck, because Buck was an ambassador. At, you know, I'm from New York, and when I came here, I really didn't understand Buck because I'm like, I'm hurt. You hurt me. I'm hurting you. <laughs> and, and Buck, every program oh. I seen him on, Buck was gracious. He mm -hmm. always Kansas City first. And if whatever happens to him, that's minor. And I don't, I, I think if he would have got in the Hall of Fame, I do not believe uh, these coins and all the hard work that you did, I do not believe yeah. that would have happened. And so mm -hmm. I told you off camera, I would bet my life. I, I really don't say no stuff like that, that Buck get in the hall this uh, time. As, as I told folks, you know, cross your fingers, cross your arms, cross your legs, cross your toes. And if you can cross your eyes, cross those two in hope that this will happen and send up a little prayer. We might need a little divine intervention. I certainly believe that it's going to happen. And like I said, I have to prepare as if it is, but also I need to be ready for what happens if it doesn't happen. And so, uh, but what I, what I do say is he absolutely deserves to be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. The question that is usually the guiding principle for the Hall of Fame, can you tell the story of baseball without Buck O'Neill? And I don't think you can. What Buck O'Neill did just in building the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, becoming that incredible ambassador that you talked about, by not allowing us to fall out of love with baseball, even in moments when we were ready to fall out of love with baseball, doing work stoppages. and Because I fell out of love with it. And a lot of Black people fell out of, love, out of love with really. it. And yeah. that's why we don't have the athletes. And Buck, what I was saying, was an ambassador yeah. that yeah. brought me back. And yeah. you have continued his yeah. tradition. Yeah, no, and that, that's what we've tried to do. And that's certainly what I've tried to do. I, I embrace the spirit of Buck O'Neill. And, and in uh, the tone, that's the thing. See, anybody <laughs> can be, be there. But Buck was like, you smack him in the face. And he'd be like, why'd you do that? That didn't make sense, son. Me, you smack <laughs> me in my face. I'm ready to take your head. And you have been that the quintessential ambassador for what that Negro League has needed. Oh, well, really. I, tell, I tell people all the time, I am trying to be more Buck-like. I'm not there yet. I'm still a work in progress because to be honest, I get mad every time I tell the story of what happened to him in 2006, because it, to me, it just did not make any sense. There was no rationale whatsoever for that decision. And I have to remind myself that if people voted their conviction, now if you really believe in your heart that Buck O'Neill didn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, I can't be mad at you about that. Now, I disagree with you, but I can't be mad at you about that. I think what left us kind of all in such a lurch was that nobody could tell you why. We they stay kind no, of we know why kind of process. No, we know, you know? Pull it. This is how I am again uh, against everything because I'm a black network. Systemic racism cannot be taken out of any picture or any conversation that we are dealing with on anything. Because the structure of America, and that includes all the sports and everything, 
from amateur sports to the Olympics, how to structure. And Buck got other guys in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> from, how, from how I look at it, even sure the did. stories that you tell, propagating that, definitely got to have a, a, a mindset. And I think all of that, I'm more like, what's the catcher that Gibson? Yeah. Uh, and I know only a little bit about him from like Bingo Long and that type of stuff, but he wasn't no Buck O'Neill. He was upset about- There, was, there weren't very many Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill was that classic glass half full individual. Everybody else might see it half empty. Empty, that's me. Yeah, yeah, Buck saw it half full. So he was going to, he had a certain innateness about him that allowed him to see the good in people, even when they were bad. It, it allowed him to see the good in people. And, and, and honestly, Carlos, I asked him, I said, Buck, where did that come from? And you know what he told me? He said, my daddy told me when I was a little boy, treat every man the way you want to be treated, the golden rule. Now, we all know the golden rule. Right. We don't all live the golden rule. And Buck took something. Because it's so hard. damn hard. Because it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, no, no, it is hard. You know, and it didn't mean that he wouldn't wasn't strong enough to object to things that were happening in his world, but he was also loving enough to forgive those who tried to perpetrate. Now that I have some age <laughs> on me, uh, I realize, and I always have, but you don't want to admit it to do those type things and maintain that type of attitude you you stronger than the the guys that are striking out oh you're absolutely you, 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 I, you, I remind you. people i remind people when they sometimes the young kids will come into the museum and they'll hear these horrific things that jackie robinson endured when he broke the color barrier with brooklyn and some of them will say well he must have been soft he was some kind of uncle tom no, not Jackie Robinson. He was as fiery and feisty an individual as you would ever meet. And as Buck would say, he could duke and would duke. He knocked you on your own. But he humbled himself for the greater good. And the, the old adage is, you can't smoke flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And, and, and I think Buck understood that. He, he understood that. He was a very proud man who found the ability to universally love people. And, and that's not something that we just see on a regular basis, you know, but he was also very spiritually grounded. And that's what you find with, with a lot of Black folks in particular, because we had to be in order to endure what we had to endure as, as we were trying to progress in this society. And, and so I think when you combine all of that with a level of self-assuredness, so don't get it, I tell people, don't get it twisted. Buck O'Neill knew who he was. Yeah, he knew who he was. He identified with himself. And honestly, the Hall of Fame would have benefited from having Buck O'Neill in it. Maybe even more than Buck O'Neill would have benefited from getting the Hall of Fame call. And, and so here's this very self-assured man who, when he didn't get in, he took it like a man. You know, I told you, I still get mad. I still get mad. And there was Buck O'Neill telling all of us not to be angry. Don't be bitter. Yeah. That's exactly okay. what he said. I still remember seeing <laughs> different things on TV when people was interviewing him and what have you. And as you, as you say, he reminds me, because I'm 70, of older Black men on farm, off the farm. They had their dignity intact. And they lived by certain things. And they kids, he came, really came out that generation where dad gave me wisdom and I took it and I handed it on. And Buck lived a long time, seen a lot a of different time. things. He, he lived a long, very much fulfilled life. And I think that's why he was better prepared to deal with that kind of setback. For me, it was, it was so disappointing because it was almost as if, okay, yeah, you mentioned it, he had gotten so many into the Hall of Fame. 
And again, spiritually, I liken it to Moses leading the people to the promised land. And then you don't get across. See, I don't, I don't liken it to that. You know what I like it? I didn't want to bring this up, Bob. I liken it to when they didn't give you that damn job at first. <laughs> No, well, I, I, I do, wanted to say that now, a long time ago in this now, I do say, I, I say this, and, and this is why I know that God puts us in places for reasons. And when I was there with Buck, when he didn't get in, you don't really recognize or maybe completely grasp or understand why you were there to witness that until I go through my own setback. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing me not getting the job but the they, to me, I am. I'm not to, saying to you are because I've thing. known met them. Yeah. I've known you a long yeah. time, and it, like Buck was supposed to get in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> that was supposed to be the shoe in for you. You was like the prodigy son, and <laughs> I was like, man, I don't know how this Negro is going to uh, really be cool. That, that's a to me. That was a smack in your face. <laughs> Yeah, and no, no, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. Had I not been there with Buck to see how he handled the disappointment of not getting in the Hall of Fame, I'm not sure I would have handled my own setback as graciously as I did. And, and that's why I think that I was put in that position for a reason. I was there to see this for a reason. Buck missed by one vote. I missed by one vote. And again, the Hall of Fame is totally that. different than me getting this, getting this job. But there were these eerie, eerie similarities. And uh, it just kind of led me to say, okay, you were there for a reason and, and your turn eventually came, and which it did. It, 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 it came. And, and so I, I think I, I'm better as a result of having been there with Buck O'Neill that day. Uh, and, and I've been blessed. I know I'm better to do personally because, see, when you see that, a lot of that, like I said, is sinking in on me now about honey and and vinegar. vinegar. And <laughs> I, I'm saying, and even patience. Jim Watts and always patience, and pa can you understand patience because we live in a microwave society. We want instant gratification. So patience is not something that very many of us have much of but we probably need to develop more patience. But I'm saying, see, when you, the, the point I'm bringing in the conversation on Buck, that when you have seen this type of individual, the Jackie Robinsons, the Bucks, the Martin Luther Kings, the Malcolms, that was one way, and they, through life and, and experience, mm -hmm. uh, that translates, I know, I'm like ready to take heads, but I know <laughs> you you really, Jim Watts said, Carlos, you pop your umbrella too soon. <laughs> and, and right. And now, you know, where I'm ready to jump on somebody, I have patience. And it was like, they call you and, and I'm like, damn, why was you getting ready to do that? And as you yeah. say, you have to acquire that. Yeah, you do. You you do. But I think you're right. Some of that comes with age, sage, wisdom. You know, all of that is... is Examples is, uh, to me, seeing, yeah. you yeah. know, seeing like there are young people that are seeing what you're doing. And I think you have that young girl over there. Uh, Kiana. Yeah, that is mentoring that uh, she's very quiet, but I know that she, from what I've seen, she's a sponge. And yeah, yeah, she's soaking it. She's soaking it all up. She is energizing a new generation of people because we have to do that. You know, we're all getting older, but our story needs to be relevant to a new generation. And so that's part of her task. But there are these eerie similarities that I see with her with me because I came in as a volunteer to this organization. Well, she volunteered for this organization. I was able to stand there with Buck O'Neill and be there with him and soak up all this stuff that I now utilize to this day. And, and I hope that she will take in that opportunity to learn this organization from inside out. 
uh, an outside in so that, you know, when the time comes that she'll be prepared to, to maybe pick up the baton. I'm so know, happy that you say, chose her or about she about chose you. I'm so happy because yeah. with Cascade Sports right now, this is the year of the girls and the women that we're mm -hmm. dealing with, uh, yeah. high school in general, and they have gotten a short change. And for you to have her up under your arms at the Negro League, it's like them uh, women pitches that you uh, have had on display. I love it. But what you love to find is people who have passion. You know, there's that you can't overstate what passion means in anything that we do. When you're passionate about what you do, uh, I think that comes across and, and people feel that and, and they want to be a part of that. And I think that's what happened to me as I stumbled into this world of Negro Leagues when I was, you know, started in this organization as a volunteer. That was 28 years ago. And, and I still am just as passionate about this museum and this history as I was the first day I encountered it. What's happening with later. those coins? Man, the coins, I mean, you know, I, I told him at the press conference uh, uh, on Wednesday that one of my favorite movies is coming to America. And, and you remember when, when John Amos looks at the money, and said, I said, this boy got his own money. And when I say he got his own money, I mean, he got his own money. And, and the Negro Leagues Museum essentially has his own money. Uh, thanks to an amazing uh, move that we were able to make to get Congress to pass legislation authorizing the US Mint to create a series of commemorative coins celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Negro Leagues. And so we had an unveiling ceremony to show people what the designs of these coins are going to look like here at the museum on Wednesday, November the 10th. And this was bipartisan legislation. I want people to understand that. This was Democrats and Republicans coming together during a very contentious presidential election year where they didn't do too many things together. Hell, if one walked out and said, it's sunny today, the other side gonna say, no, it ain't. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get over three quarters of Congress Ooh. to sign off on this legislation. It is so significant. Obviously, it's very prestigious to get these coins because they're highly competitive. We beat out some significant institutions to get, to, to be in line, to get these coins. And then, as I mentioned, to do it, to get bipartisan what, what are the financial implications? Or, and for that's exactly the, where we were going. All right. Yeah, because beyond the prestige is the realization that if we're able to sell the full allotment as authorized by the legislation, we could generate some $6 million in revenue for the museum from these coins. These coins will be minted in 2022. And so you can see that there's a lot riding on our ability to market these coins and get them in the hands, not only of coin collectors, but because it takes on this cultural theme, I think it's going to expand the base of people who will want to have one of these very rare, significant coins that really pays tribute to a hundred years of Negro Leagues baseball. But what will $6 million do for the museum? Just talk about oh, a little bit on it, that. It's a game changer. It's a game changer, but more importantly, six million gives me an opportunity to leverage it to turn it into 12 million. And uh, because now you can look at matching funds and you got something legitimate that you can go knock on the doors of prospective donors and say, hey, here's what we're doing. And we, in the process of doing this, we are now setting up this organization for long-term sustainability. And, and that's always the challenge with cultural institutions. Most smaller cultural institutions are living basically mouth to mouth and from month to month. And, and we've been able to survive the economic landscape to put the museum in a pretty strong financial situation. Now that is always fluid, as you know, with any business. Hell, you know, what works now can change the next day. And, and so, 
But this is an opportunity to create an endowment and to make sure that the operating needs of this organization are in place, that we can continue to build exhibit program, the other community outreach things that we like to do, feel like we need to do, and, and have some financial stability above and beyond for years to come. So, you know, that's my goal. My goal is to get this full 6 million, turn it into 12 million, and then after that, I'm not sure what I'm going to what, do. <laughs> what stamps do they have out? Huh? I'm sorry? What stamps do, they, do y'all have out? Now, you know, we did the stamp program with the, with the post office several years ago. What was that? And so you no. had the Gibson, you had the Satchel Page, you had the Ruth Foster stamps. And I think they still are in circulation. But see, the post office doesn't give up any money. The oh. post office ain't giving up any money. They, they happy to celebrate you. But here with the Mint, the way that this program is set up, the taxpayers are not out of any money. So the Mint will recoup the cost for minting the coins. And then once, that, once those expenses are recovered, all the surcharges will come back. How, how, is, your, how, is, your, how is the uh, gift shop going? And, oh, man, uh, it's, still, it's still doing tremendous business. Even during the downtime, as we've been dealing with COVID, where you're not seeing quite as much foot traffic as we would have. You know, the gift shop is built around the, the people coming in. We kind of had the Disney philosophy. We built this museum so that you walk out into our gift shop. You know, uh, we, we didn't have the storefront gift shop like our, our sister, the Jazz Museum does, but you can miss the gift shop there. And, and, and with our place, you can't leave without right, going to the gift shop. Tell me this. You know? uh, <clears throat> Have you all gone online with the gift shop yet? Yes, yes. No, we're online. <laughs> and the uh, online store is doing well. And particularly when, when COVID first hit, you know, because we were shut down from March 14th uh, through June 16th of last year. And then we reopened and our numbers fell tremendously, as you can well imagine. But we saw the online aspect of our business start to grow. And so we came out of 2020, and we are July 1, June 30th fiscal year. And uh, we had one of the most successful years we've had, even in the face of COVID. And I, I couldn't be more proud of our team and how we persevered during what was such a difficult time, during what was arguably the most important year on record for the museum as we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Negro League. This was supposed to be a major milestone year filled with celebratory events that were going to jumpstart this significant fundraising campaign to raise some $20 million for this museum. And all of a sudden, here's a doggone pandemic and, and you can't do any of those things. Speaking yet, of that- uh, then We persevered. Speaking of that, I want to know, uh, and I guess my guests, uh, my viewers would want to know how uh, did all that flooding at the NIG uh, over at the Y, how did that really turn out? Uh, because it was it was a big mess. And it was. It, it was. And, and, and we're still very, very recovering from it. That. No, we're still recovering from it. Uh, because the thing that I learned, Carlos, is the, the damaging power of water. Uh, I mean, water leaves a trail of destruction. And, and so when they went in and committed that heinous crime, and, and this wasn't your run of the mill copper theft. No, this wasn't anybody trying to steal copper. This was someone who really wanted to blatantly destroy the building. Yeah, I know, because when I seen that footage, you know, I was in contracting. Yeah, Man, so you, no, know. you had to have special equipment to cut them pipes. They, that, that wasn't like I'm snatching some copper to go to the place and get some money. Get, get, get some change, yeah. No, no that, somebody no, that, was upset at the Negro oh, League. And, 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 and that's the thing that I will never know because we didn't owe anybody any money. But clearly somebody felt like they were either not getting something that they thought they were supposed to get. And they set out to try and destroy that project. 
And, and that's what hurts you. That's what breaks your heart because the community loved this project. They had invested themselves. They are in the building with Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates was in there in his overall. Yeah. yeah. In his overall with the wheelbarrow moving debris, you know, when we started this project and the community was coming in and helping him. And uh, now he was one of the most successful businessmen in Kansas City in overalls and his boots with a wheelbarrow moving debris. That's how much this project meant to him. But it also meant a lot to the community because if you recall, the Purcell YMCA was really the only blighted building on the Purcell. And here we were finally taking control of it. We got it cleaned up, shored up the exterior, gutted the interior, had started the interior redesign when somebody decided that they wanted to try and destroy the project. So yeah, that hurt you to your core. And of course, with all that water, we had to tear out everything. Now you got to deal with mold and mildew, uh, getting rid of all of that. And so we're now just getting regenerated on this project. And so I think by the turn of the calendar year, you'll see some more movement there in the Buckle Neal Center. There's, or the two, future Buckle there's Center. two or three other things. I want to know, uh, and you, uh, you, cause you got the damn elephant memory. Tell me, tell the people how many bubble heads we have and what's going on with that. We got a bunch, man. We, we, we got a bunch, you know, it's been funny to see the popularity of, of bobbleheads, including one that features yours truly and Buck O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got one that they call the Buck and Bob tip your cap to the Negro Leagues, because if you remember last summer, one of the things that we did that went viral was a crazy campaign that I came up with called Tip Your Cap to the Negro League. Oh, yeah. I, man, I, I'm on social media. Everybody was <laughs> tipping their cap. The pre, I think the president tipped the president. cap. Yeah, no, because I think if you understand baseball, there's nothing more honorable that a ball player can do than just a simple tip of the cap. It's the ultimate show of respect. And, and so we were supposed to do this in stadium last year. And of course, we were going to do it on June 27th of last year. But in, when you got to June 27th, Major League Baseball wasn't even playing yet. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know if there was going to be a baseball season because baseball and the Players Association were still in very much contentious negotiations about not only if, but when they were going to bring the game back. And, and so I came up with this crazy idea to do a virtual tip your cap. And I reached out to my good friend, the great writer, Joe Posnansky. Uh, who is my brother. We're not biological brothers, but we are as thick as brothers. And, and as I tell people all the time, I always vet my bad ideas with Joe. <laughs> and so I called Joe. I said, Joe, man, I got this idea to do a virtual tip your cap to the Negro League. And I'm waiting for him to tell me, Bob, that's a crazy idea. We don't have enough time to pull that together. And he didn't say that. He thought it was a great idea. And then he reached out to his business partner, a guy named Dan McGinn. Dan is a tremendous communication strategist out of the DC area. And he reached out to Dan and Dan thought it was a great idea. And uh, the three of us went to work. And, and when we launched this campaign on June 29th of last year, we launched the cam campaign, as you mentioned, with four US presidents tipping their cap. President Obama, Clinton, Bush, and Carter, transcending athletes like Henry Aaron, the late great Henry Aaron, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Billy Jean King, Bob Costas, entertainers like Stephen Colbert, Conan O'Brien. Hell, we even went to Motown and got a cap tip from the Temptations. And, <laughs> and then, man, when we literally went into outer space, we got I've a seen tip it. of the cap. Yeah, yeah. tip of the cap from astronaut Chris Cassidy who was aboard the International Space Station, I knew then that we had done something. I had stole it. Um, let me tell you, I stole it. I got a, 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 you know how Gates has the strutting man? Yes, yes. All yes. right. I, it's a silhouette, and it looked like the strutting man, but he's bent over, tipping his hat. And all it. So I tipped my hat to Gwen Grant. She stood up on something. And I use that now when I'm <laughs> call it, when I'm honoring somebody. We'll tip tip your hat. And I, I said, 
I don't know who came up with this, but I'm stealing it. <laughs> well, man, I tell you what, it, and it just took off. It went viral. And, and for those who want to see some of these amazing cap, cap tips, they can go to tippingyourcap.com. It's still there. The site's still active, still alive, and see some of the amazing people. But then what you saw, Carlos, was all of a sudden this filtering down to kids playing baseball, little kids playing. And they're standing there taking their picture, tipping their they cap. Had. Yeah. I'm saying because that was a genius moment. Uh, yeah, no, well, you know, it, it, it was genius because it worked. Now, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that was an epiphany. That just didn't come to you, man. That's an epiphany. Uh, the the more simplistic you are, because I'm in media. The more simplistic you yeah. are, the, yeah. uh, And that was the that was the beauty of the idea, because people just took a photograph of themselves or a video of themselves tipping their cap. I mean, you know, you look up and there's Paul Rudd, actor Paul Rudd who I guess People Magazine says the sexiest man in Hollywood, Paul Rudd got on a Buffalo Mill shirt and a Kansas City Monarch cap, and there he was tipping his cap to the Negro League. I what mean, else is up for, uh, we, you, you, you would do the hot dog festivals and the, yeah, what and else I is up for this? All those things back. I hope to bring all those things back next year. Now, next year is a really significant year, even beyond the commemorative coins, which is going to be huge. But next year marks the 75th anniversary of baseball, Major League Baseball's color barrier being broken. And we will have a year long celebration in recognition of that milestone anniversary. And for us, Carlos, it goes far deeper than just Jackie breaking the color barrier with the Dodgers. We will examine and chronicle all of the players who broke their respective major league teams color barrier. Because as I remind people all the time, it didn't get any easier for Elijah Pumpsy Green, who would break the color barrier with the Boston Red Sox 12 years after Jackie, 1959. And you can rest assured that it didn't get any easier for Pumpsy Green in 1959 in Boston than it did for Jackie Robinson in 1947. Bob, let me cut you off for a minute because my memory be going bad on me. But that's what I wanted to say just as a, a black man that uh, on uh, these barrier breaking things, uh, they always throw up Jackie. Mm -hmm. They always, and, and boy, I am so happy that you're talking about these. Uh, they, you know, you boy, I never knew nothing about no damn cool Papa Bell or 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 some of the people that you did those things with us. And America doesn't know. And no. I on everything, it's like throw up Martin Luther King, the only civil rights. There were so many different people, and I am so happy. And you can't do what you're about to do without corporate participation, oh, community. Absolutely. And that means dollars and cents. Yeah, no, no, that's what it, it, it requires. But, you know, I'm excited about this because we tell all of their stories. And, and Jackie's story has been well documented. Most people know Jackie Robinson's story. And he was the first. He's the pioneer. And, and, you know, as we typically do in our society, we always celebrate the first. Larry Doby would integrate the American League literally weeks after Jackie, and he's almost an afterthought. Don't nobody yeah. know that, and you got to be a baseball fan to know, you know Larry, Larry Doby. And well, he's, he's what I say. And I, I say that Jackie Robinson, for Black folks, was equivalent to Neil Armstrong being the first man to land on the moon. It was complete euphoria. Larry Doby was essentially our Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin was second man to land on the moon. Nobody ever talks about Buzz. Right. He gets no love. And that was Larry Doby. And, but there are also five guys who go up in 1947. So it's not just Jackie, Larry Doby, Hank Thompson, Willard Brown, and Dan Bankhead. Where did they go? You mentioned in that. 1947. Mention, tell them, tell the audience what teams they went to, because you said. Well, you yeah, so Jackie, of course, joins the Brooklyn Dodgers. Larry Doby integrates the American League with the Cleveland Indians. Hank Thompson and Willard Brown 
would go to the St. Louis Browns. And then Dan Bankhead would join Jackie at Brooklyn. Three of those players, Carlos, came from the Kansas City Monarchs. So you can see why the Kansas City Monarchs owner was not too excited about this. Mm -hmm. You're going to put me out of business. He sold his team to his business partner, T.Y. Baird, the year after Jackie breaks the color barrier, 1948. He sells the team to T.Y. Baird. And because the handwriting was on the wall, it wasn't a matter of if the Negro Leagues were going to go out of business. It was simply a matter of when the Negro Leagues were going to go out. You couldn't siphon all of this talent out and there's no replacement system. So it, it and, and so and then the other side of it is we left the Negro Leagues too because now we want to go see Jackie play. We want to go see Larry play because we wanted to see how our great black stars were going to fare now that they had the opportunity to compete at what the world had said was the highest level in which you could play baseball. I don't think the guys in the Negro Leagues ever believed that. But the world said, no matter what they had done in building the Negro Leagues, the world still said the highest level that you can play is in the major leagues. So they wanted to prove to the world that they were as good as anyone. Satchel Page takes a pay cut to go to the major leagues when he joins Cleveland in 1948. Yeah, because he, the old man wanted to show that, hey, man, if y'all had let me in, I'd have dominated this league too. <laughs> See, the, the overriding factor to me uh, maybe seven, maybe even 10 years ago uh, or shorter, you were saying most black sports come through the major league oh, baseball. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I want to, uh, cause we've had this a long interview, but I want to have another interview with you, not just on baseball, because right now I'm, uh, we're interviewing all the HBCU presidents and we yeah. do a lot of HBCU stuff. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so many guys, so many guys from Negro Leagues who went to HBCU. Right, but that that's the holy, that's the conversation. But more so, my our, our next segment I want is like I was talking to you about high school baseball and yeah. high school. What we did as black people uh, has drastically changed. You say the Negro League, I say HBCU. Negro League was because we couldn't play in the major leagues. Uh, HBCUs because we couldn't really don't, don't study. Know yeah, is. all right. HBCU sports uh, was really what now the NFL, the NBA, and what have you. So uh, when you start, when you said that... Uh, he sold the team because he seen the writing on the wall. That is what has happened to our HBCUs, that all the talent has gone. And yeah, yeah. No, and I want to have an in-depth conversation. Yeah, no, that'll be you. fun. That, that'll be fun because when no Southeastern Conference schools started recruiting Black players, for years they weren't recruiting Black players. And I will forever believe that is why Alabama scheduled USC. That's why Bear Bryant scheduled USC to come to Tuscaloosa to play when USC had Sam the Bam Cunningham. And, and Sam Cunningham ran all over the Clemson Tide. And when he left, Bear Bryant said, I'm going to get me one of them. Yeah, and he's been getting them ever since. <laughs> had that, just in the last couple of days, I've had that conversation because uh, that's why I want to have it with you, that yeah. uh, my brother-in-law, Leon Harden, Leon went to Texas El Paso. But uh, my homie, Nate Archibald, was there when it was uh, whatever, and they, they beat Kentucky. Yeah, they and beat Kentucky, yeah. that changed uh, college sports forever. And as you said, that's where I got that. I didn't know where I got that saying from about Bear Bryant because I always bring him up and I said, uh, I'd be saying, and Bear said, nah, no matter what y'all are saying down here, we can't win unless we get some of them down and here. We went and, got it, and they ain't stopped getting them since then. Yeah. <laughs> but what has that done?
done to our community. And that's, well, and that's the thing, saying. you know, and so it, 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 it makes for a great conversation because for me, the HBCUs were very close to going the plight of the Negro League. And uh, these great institutions of higher learning uh, need to be protected and preserved as well. And, and those great athletes who had no choice but to go to those HBCUs, all of a sudden were given an opportunity to go to these other institutions. They were getting full ride scholarships to go to those institutions, much the way in which when the doors open in the Negro Leagues, those players left for more lucrative opportunities and it ultimately killed the Negro League. But that is, Deion Sanders is the Bob Kendricks of <laughs> HBCU right now. Yeah, no, it's great to see Dion at an HBCU. It's great to see my friend Eddie George uh, now coaching over at Tennessee, Tennessee State. Tennessee, we got Eddie coming on next week. Oh, fantastic, man. You tell him I said hello. We're all part of an effort to try and bring uh, Major League Baseball to Nashville. And if we're successful, the team will be called the Nashville Stars after the old Negro Leagues team. It's a tremendous partnership. Eddie visited the museum, had a great time with him, man, when he came in. To see the museum. He was absolutely blown away by what he experienced here. And, and so then I went down and played in his golf tournament earlier this year. He so was he very was, disappointed cutting you off again. I'm the cutoff king. Yeah. They had homecoming and the crowd that turned, like you, you said, once Jackie went to the majors, they wanted to see. And 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 that and that's where our HBC. We're not filling up our stadiums like uh, we got. We got. We got to regenerate that interest, and having high-profile high coaches like that, and we're starting to see some of these kids, particularly some of these kids playing basketball, understanding that okay, well, I'm gonna be one and done anyway. I don't have to go to Kentucky, you know, or one of these other major institutions. I'm gonna be one and done anyway, so I'm gonna go to Hampton University. I'm gonna go to Howard. You know, I'm going to go to Tennessee State University. Well, Jackson. they're looking that way now. Yeah, yeah. And, and so there is kind of an awakening along those lines. And, and hopefully that will bode well for our historically Black colleges and universities. In, in closing, what would you have to say to our audience? No, I, I just want to thank everybody for their continued support of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And we are working so hard to create an institution that everybody will be proud of. Give a shout out to the staff. Let let, oh, let, let, the, let our community know who is the backbone of your operation. Cause I know they keep me up. They used to, I, I pop up over there, they be Nelson. Don't you know, Mr. Hey, get out of here. <laughs> nah, and I'm, well, you know, not, no, they don't it, say that, but I'm, you know no, me. But, no, I, I, I get much of the accolades because I'm the front man. But I'm able to do what I do because I already know that this, this museum is going to run and it's going to run extraordinarily well with a group of very dedicated, passionate people who believe in what we do here. They are proud to be associated and part of this organization. And I think we've all bought into the understanding that this is bigger than any of us. And that if we do it right, we have an opportunity to leave a legacy. And there are not many things that you can do in our society that allows you to leave a legacy. We talked about this earlier. We are a we are me society. We want instant gratification and we want stuff for us. But here we are working diligently to leave something behind that others will enjoy for generations to come. So, you know, I talk about it from the standpoint that maybe one day my granddaughter will bring her child and say, you know, your great grandfather had something to do with that museum. And they'll walk into this experience and they'll be very proud of what their, grand, their great grandfather and great grandfather tried to do. And that's what motivates all of us, man. That's what motivates me with my business is, uh, it's not about me, it's about leaving a legacy, a history yeah. of what, uh, black people and people of color have accomplished in the areas that we we, we cover. Yeah. Uh, I'm still in Jim Watts's line. He closes <laughs> with, 
uh, it was a plum pleasing pleasure to have <laughs> you on the show. He's so got so much self affair <laughs> with him. Uh, but as we close, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Good night. This program is brought to you by the City of Fountains Coaches Association.